time, we're in the middle of a series called Exercising Authority. And it's a message series about biblical authority and the God-given authority that we possess as children of God. If you're a child of God, then you have access to this authority. And I've touched on this verse from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, um, throughout the, the time where Jesus you know, mentions that. But the, the tagline of this message series is God is the author of life, and therefore God has the authority. You see, it's right there in the word. If you're the author of something, you have authority over your creation. And, and uh, Jesus, when he rose from the grave in Matthew chapter 28 that I just mentioned, in verse 18, he told his disciples, listen, all authority in heaven and right where we're at, we're on the earth, right? So who has the authority? Jesus, amen. So we're going to recap so that we're all up to the same page uh, from the previous uh, three weeks. Now that we're four weeks in, in the first week, we talked about biblical authority and why we can trust the Bible. If somebody were to come up to you and say, how do you know the Bible's true? How can I trust the Bible? What I would do and what I did that week was lay out a case that Jesus uh, speaks to almost all of the major miracles from the Old Testament. He quotes tons of Old Testament prophets, and he treats everything that happened in the Old Testament as if it's actually happened. And Jesus is one to know. So anyone can say that. But when Jesus flipped over the the temple tables in John chapter 2, they said, what, author- you know, what sign can you give to prove your authority to do all this stuff, right? Jesus was cleaning house that day, and he said, tear down this temple, and in three days, I, you know, I'll raise it again. And they thought he was talking about the temple, but he was talking about his body, because Corinthians talks about the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that alone, the resurrection, puts an exclamation mark on every saying that Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the truth. He didn't just speak the truth. He was the truth. And Jesus, from Adam and Eve to Abel, uh, Abraham, Noah, not just Noah, but the flood, not just Jonah, but Jesus compared himself to Jonah and said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, I'm just going gonna, gonna to be exactly like that. So he validates events that happened in the past so we can trust the Bible. And that's what we learned in the first week. And then the second week, because the Bible is true, we look to this as our moral authority, okay? Not that we're all amazing morally, right? But we have a standard that we can point to. The world does not have a standard that they can point to, and we can see that happening clearly, right? G.K. Chesterton uh, said in his day, he said that these people who, who don't use the Bible as their authority they're essentially, their feet are firmly planted in midair. So um, we have the authority. And what the world perceives as arrogance from us, we're proclaiming as authority. Not because we're amazing, but because we stand on Jesus' righteousness. And we proclaim the truth of God's word, even if we don't always measure up to it. As Roman says, we fall short of that sometimes, right? And so in week three, we talked about spiritual authority. And that belongs to us in Jesus' name. And hopefully you can see that. And uh, if I could just cap up last week uh, in this way. Have you ever seen or even seen a preview or at least aware of this show called Intervention? I've seen a few where, um, you know, the family, friends, everybody that loves this one person, they trick him or somehow get him to be somewhere where they all kind of confront him. And I've seen, you know, where they're, they're barring the door and, you know, taking, you know, flack from this person that, that wants out. And uh, they forcibly are, are, are acting in the life of someone they love. They're with force. They're saying, hey, no, we're, we're standing in the way and we're, we're saying you're out of control. And that person doesn't agree with them most of the time. But what I see when I see that show is is that we have that spiritually, spiritually. Okay, so anyway, in week three, it was kind of like like a, an intervention. And the Bible says, you know, when, we, when, when the dis- disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? And he said, um, you know, ask for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done 
on as it is in very good. And so we have the ability and we have uh, the authority to ask God to intervene in our world. We can invite God into workplaces that are godless. We can invite God into family situations where they haven't invited him, but we did. He's our invited guest. Amen. And so that's what we talked about that week. So the, fir the first week, we can trust the Bible. Number two, it's our guide to life and conduct. And three, we can invite God into any, any situation. And so this morning, we can invite God personally into our own battles that we're facing. And let me just pray. Lord, uh, where my words fail, Holy Spirit, fill uh, those gaps, all of those flaws and failures and... Uh, deficiencies, you can fulfill, you can fill those things, even with the words that I have. Use them powerfully in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to talk about emotional authority. We're going to proclaim authority over our emotions. And no, this isn't one of those power of positive thinking messages. It's not one of those. In fact, the only thing I'm positive about is that I fail. Right, honey? Occasionally. I fail, but I know this, Christ's power is made perfect in our weaknesses. So week one, the word of God is true. Week two, all scripture is good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, right? 2 Timothy 3.16. Week three, we allow God, we can insert God into any situation in our life, right? The Lord's prayer, right? And this week, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to have authority over our emotions, okay? And so uh, a verse that I really want you to uh, get, just understand comes from Romans chapter 12. It's verses 1 and 2. Paul says this to the church, therefore, I urge you. He's urging you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Um, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if you have your notes this morning, the first thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about separating personality from emotion. Now, uh, oftentimes I give unscientific definitions. It doesn't mean they're uh, wrong. It's just when you when you start to to give 100% precise definitions of anything, you end up with books this thick. Trust me. Okay. So rather than ending up with a book this thick, okay, I would rather than be 100% precise. I'd rather be 100% clear. Because if we're 100% clear, then we can make a decision about what we've learned, okay? We don't say it was a beautiful earth turn this morning, do we? Do you know what I'm referring to? Okay, so we, we want to be 100% clear. So this is what I've come up with. This is my idea. It doesn't mean it's 100% precise, okay? So here, here's, here's what I want you to know. Personality is how we act, and emotion is how we react, okay? And I didn't write it down so that you could write it down, because if you write it down, you're more likely to remember that. So personality is how I reflect about something, and emotion is how I respond to that thing. Okay, now God gave all of us unique personalities. He did. And my wife and I, uh, we see that in our five children. You know, we have, we're, we, we've contributed the same amount of DNA and uh, everything else that goes into making those kids, right? They're from the same batch, okay? But they have different personalities. Some of our kids are they, they're more gifted in math and science than others. Some of our kids have more giftings in language, in the language arts than others. Uh, some of our kids are cleaner and more organized than others. And we thought, we thought that that was an age-related uh, discrepancy between their personalities. Like once they get a certain age, then they get more organized and clean. No, 
okay? They're from from some of our younger children, I, I, I can't go any further because then I'd be throwing kids under the bus. I'm not here to do that. But, but we see that the organizational and the, and the cleanliness of, of children are different because they have different personalities. Some of our kids require more sleep than others. And that's a fact. And so, yes, they overlap a little bit in some areas, but they have unique personality traits that we're dealing with the same, you know, same batch, like I said. And so when we come to faith in Christ, we're not called to be lobotomized, comatose, personality-less zombies. We're not. Whatever personality you had, we're going to talk about that this morning that you're not called to throw that away. Unfortunately, if you've ever watched Jesus films of the past, oftentimes they make Jesus like this, I don't know, like he's almost like a Batman character. Not the Adam West Batman, but like all of the Batmans, of the, you know, pensively brooding over Jerusalem. Bartholomew, go back to the cave and bring me my cloak. We're going down to the temple. Okay, I'm overdoing it a little bit, but if you've seen a couple of these Jesus movies, you might go, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about, where Jesus is just like, he never has any emotion, and that's not accurate. And so when I read the Gospel of Mark, when I read God, uh, Mark chapter 10, there's kids that are hanging around Jesus, playing with them. Because Jesus, when the opportunity presented itself, must have been joyful and happy. And so it takes all kinds of personalities to make up the body of Christ. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's all kinds of personalities. Thankfully, this world isn't just one homogenous personality. Because if that were the case, imagine that that one personality, that you were different, and they all liked rap for their favorite style of music. Aren't you glad we have different personalities? Or they all liked country. Those are the two widest varying degrees of musical preference. I like both, by the way. That's really weird. But, but it takes all personalities to make up the body of Christ. And we see that in Corinthians when you know people say, hey, you want to be this body part, but we can't all be that body part because then we wouldn't be the body. Right? If we were a gigantic eye, that would be very scary. Okay. So the bottom line is God isn't trying to change your personality, but He wants us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, and to renew our minds and to bring our emotions under spiritual authority of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, I will tell you the truth. I did not understand that concept when I went away to Bible college. So just personally, a, a testimony in my life is I drove 700 miles to this, away from here to this Bible college where everybody looked a lot different and they sounded a lot different. And I compared myself with those differences and I, it, it caused me to have negative emotions. Uh, they were unhealthy. They were absolutely sinful. I was angry, and oftentimes I was rebellious, which is sin. And uh, here's what I learned. I didn't learn it there, but I'm not called to look like any particular minister, okay? I'm called to take up my cross and follow Jesus. And likewise, neither are you called to look like any particular Christian, and where do we get that from? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Matthew 16, 24, right there. Now, some ministers I aspire to be like, and some ministers I admire immensely, but I'm not called to look like them. That's not what I'm called to do. Instead, I'm called to follow Jesus, and I'm called to deny myself. And so what does that mean? Denying ourselves, uh, taking up our cross and denying ourselves means it doesn't have to do with 
changing our personalities, but getting rid of the flesh and the excesses of our sinful nature, how we respond and how we, uh, you know, react to things that happen to us that we don't particularly like, right? And so you're not called to dump the uniqueness of who God created you to be personality-wise. And it's bad thinking, and I've thought this from where you said, I've thought if I just had this gift or this trait or I acted like this person, then I would be a better Christian. And uh, it being, I just for the, for the sake of... Um, lack of a definition, but being a better Christian is taking up our cross. That's what being a better Christian looks like and letting the Holy Spirit transform our minds, okay? So denying ourselves, you see this verse, denying ourselves doesn't say look like someone else. If anyone should come after me, he should look like so-and-so, take up his cross and follow me. It's denying ourselves, right? So um, if that's applicable to everyone, then no matter who you th- want to look like, they're called to deny themselves too. And, to, and so when we talk about denying ourselves, we're talking about the sinful, fleshly excesses of our lives. So personality is how we act, which is our bent, and emotion is how we react. And so negative emotions like worry or anger is reacting to something you don't like, okay? And so we should never, we should never as believers say that that's part of our personality, right? Oh, you know me, I'm just a worrier. No, you're a warrior, right? The Bible says you're a warrior. You should not, you should not take that, those sinful emotional things that we have, you should not say that that's part of your personality. Those are not part of your personality. They are part of the fall of man, okay? And so excesses in the flesh are not personality traits. We need to deny those, and we see that here. And I believe that that's a spiritually fatal mistake that people in, our, in the body of Christ are making, that they're saying, whatever the sin is, it could be something like fear or depression or doubt or, you know, or anger, rage, malice, whatever it is. That's not who you are. That's part of your fallen nature. And you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. And so our, our, emo, our, our personalities have to come under the emotional authority of the Word of God and the transformational power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So let's talk about getting the feelings out of our emotions. How many of you have ever woke up and not felt like going to work? Wow, there's a lot of worker bees in here because, really? I felt like that. I felt like that this morning. I'm just kidding. I love speaking to you guys. I do. You're you're the highlight of my week. Actually, I... Mm? No, wait a minute. Waking up next to my wife is the highlight of my week. And that happens seven times, so you're number eight. My pastor says I'm number eight. You're the best. Okay, so you are, um, okay, let me get back on track here. Not everything you feel is true. We know this, right? Okay, not everything you feel is true. And I learned this valuable lesson from my wife. She said, when you argue, stick to the facts because arguing about how someone feels is a waste of time. Right, honey? Thank you so much. She teaches me a lot. But that's true. You know, when someone says, I feel this. No, you don't. You don't feel that way. Yes, they do. It doesn't matter if it doesn't comport with reality. Okay, that's how they feel. So you have to stick to the facts. But if you, now that's in a, in, a, in a relationship, but personally we have feelings. And some of these feelings we know are not godly. They come in in our mind and they kind of erupt in our, in our, in our life. And, and we feel a certain way and we're like, hmm, this is, this is what this message is all about. You have to take authority 
over those emotions under the power of the Holy Spirit. And you need to use the word of God to speak into your negative emotions. You need to speak authority into your negative uh, behavior, okay? And so when we feel fearful or depressed or inadequate or unrighteously angry, there's a difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. Righteous Righteous anger would be like you find out a child's being abused. You're rightfully angry, and and those emotions are, are right. But most of the time, our anger is unrighteous. The psalmist, it, it doesn't say that David wrote this song, but we usually attribute it to him. It's, you know, as the deer pants for the water, is Psalm 42. Two times in the psalm, David says the same thing. He says this in verse 5 and 11. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. He says that same thing twice. He has to speak into his life. Now, he was being carried along by the Spirit, speaking the word of God right then. But we have the word of God to read and recite when our soul is downcast within us. Okay? So he spoke into his own life, into his own situation when no one else was. And that's probably often the case in a lot of our lives. No one's speaking into your life. No one is saying, hey, you got this. Hey, God says, you know, he's going to take care of you. Hey, all these things. When no one is there to speak into your life, you have to read the word of God and proclaim it over your uh, emotions. I know I do. I know I do. I I have to. I'm not up here telling you I've mastered this. I'm telling you this is what I do when I'm failing. I proclaim these. When I'm fearful or angry, I need to speak these things into my life and proclaim authority over those emotions. And so in our modern advanced society, We have so many things that we can blame our sinfully negative, impulsive, emotional outbursts on, right? In this this world, we can blame all of our bad emotional behavior on genetics, right? That's, That's a thing now. We can blame it on ethnicity. You know, how many of you, over the course of your jobs and different jobs that you've had, have had someone flip out? And then they throw an entire people group under the bus by saying, oh, I was Italian. That's the Italian in me. Or the Irish, right? You know, in the words of a comic I heard, aren't you embarrassed? Right? This guy is going to throw an entire people group under the bus because of his emotional outbursts and blame it on his ethnicity. This is almost... Uh, 30 years ago uh, that I remember this story, but my dad was working at Ford, and they had one of those meetings, and they said, all right, we're not going to swear on the shop floor anymore, right? And someone raised their hand and said, but, but that person swears all the time, right? And they said, well, that's part of his culture. Okay, If that's part of your culture, then you need to be in this world and not of it, okay? That's a cop-out. So whatever it is, whatever your culture is, be in this world and not of it. And don't blame these things on anything like that. Nowadays, everything's diagnosed as a disease. I feel sorry for all the Christians who've had to walk out their faith before me who couldn't blame their negative emotional outburst on something clinical, right? We're lucky, right? Nowadays, we can just chalk it up to some clinical diagnosis, buy an emotional support hamster and be done with it, right? And then tell everyone, if you don't love me and forgive me, you're going to hell. We're so lucky. Now listen, here's, here's a truth that I want to make sure that the church knows. And I know that the world doesn't know. The world does not know this truth that I'm about to tell you. But I am determined to say it enough that you'll know it and you can speak it into someone else's life. By blaming anyone or anything other than ourselves, we are stripping ourselves of the power to change. Think about that. 
Are you waiting for someone else to fix you? Whatever emotional scars you have. If you're divorced, are you waiting for your ex to call you up to fix you? And worse than that, some people are waiting for people who have passed away. That phone call's not happened. I'm not trying to be flippant. That phone call's never going to come. So stop waiting on people that have passed away and start waiting on the one who lives forever. Amen? Amen. So, yeah, we hear a start of a clap. Yeah, let's go. Where you at, Bri? You're supposed to... I told Brian a long time ago when he stepped into the sound booth, I said, Bri, if you see someone clapping, you start clapping back there. Don't leave them hanging. I didn't see you clap once. Okay. Just, you've been warned. Okay. You know what he hates the most? People acknowledging him during service. That is the worst. So nobody look at him. Okay. Anyway, I love you, man, for real. So, um, where was I even at? Okay. It was such a good point, I got distracted. Let's, you know what? I'm going to cut the tape. Everybody clap, and then I'll cut it right from the clap, okay? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Is he that stupid? <laughs> yes, I am. It's part of my personality. OK. Um, here's what's ironic. You know, that truth that I told you that, that, we, um, that we wait for other people to fix our problems, right? Here's what's amazing. I, I find this totally ironic. South of us right now in Venezuela, this Maduro, this socialist thug, is literally shooting poor people in neighborhoods. Why? Because he doesn't want to give up his power. He's hanging on by a thread, right? You see, we don't like to give up our power. Yet, ironically, we freely give away our power to change to other people by blaming others. And many of us carry emotional scars. We do, don't we? We do. But, but we need to look to the one who can heal us. Amen. Amen. Now listen, if the Bible says you can change, you can change. The word of God is true. It's our moral authority. We can proclaim spiritual authority in any situation, and we can ask for uh, our, our emotions to come under the authority of the power of the Holy Spirit and the, trans and, and the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, read it. Paul describes all of these despicable things that the church of Corinth were, were engaged in. But if you read somewhere in the middle there, he says, but some of you were those things. And read the list. Read that list of things that they were. And, and if the word of God is true, and it's our moral authority, we know that from week one and two, then whatever that list says, God says you can change. Amen? It doesn't matter how old it doesn't matter what you've been told. It doesn't matter what they diagnosed. You can change in the Holy Ghost. Amen? All right. No more rhymes now. I mean it. That was fishing. See if anyone will. Nope, not this time. Okay. So here, for those of you that are still struggling, for those of you that are still struggling, maybe you've come to faith in Christ a long time ago. Here's what you need to know. Salvation is instant, and change is slow. Romans 10, 13 says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That is called salvation. The next process, once you come to faith in Christ, is called sanctification. And it's a big word, but all it means is every day you look a little bit more like Jesus. You act a little bit more like Jesus in all of your decision-making and thinking and, and, and actions. And so Romans 10, 13, salvation is, comes quickly for all who call upon the name of the Lord. And then Matthew 16, 24, we have to deny ourselves. 
take up a cross, follow Jesus. And Romans 12, we have to present our bodies as living sacrifices and ask God to transform the way we think and not to conform to this world. Paul says elsewhere in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18, he's describing what happened with Moses. Moses went up on the mountain and his face was shining because he had a, an encounter with God. And as that glow started to wane and dissipate, he started wearing a veil to hide the fact that the glow was gone. But Paul says this to the church, and he's saying it to you today, and we all with unveiled face, we don't have that. We don't have to hide because God is moving in your life. Beholding the glory of Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Um, another version says from glory to glory. Think of it this way, from little by little. So don't get discouraged. But here's what you need to know. Romans chapter 8, verse 8, says this. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God. New Living Translation puts it this way. You, uh, that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. I don't know about you, but when you, when you come to faith in Christ... There is a desire that you have when you realize your sin, you realize really what Jesus did. There's a, a desire to please God. You feel that? We have that in everything, in, in offering, in worship, in our conduct, in our speech, reading God's word, in praying. There is a hunger that starts to develop to please God. And so what you feed grows and what you don't feed starves, right? Now, I don't know if you know this, but there is a recent trend over the past couple of years of uh, buying people that live in the city, like us, city folk, except for maybe one or two. But most of us are city folk. People are buying what they are called teacup potbelly pigs, okay? Uh, they, they put all these words in front of potbelly pig. They've put nano, micro. They put apartment in these Craigslist ads, right? Apartment pig. Ooh, I have an apartment. I should get one of these po apartment potbelly pigs. Now, what you feed grows. What you don't feed starves. And so uh, I read an article, and zoologists say, they say, it doesn't matter what you put in front of potbelly pig. If you feed it, it will grow. And there's no such thing. There's, so they were, they, they, they were ripping on all these people. Because this is what it starts out as. You buy little, little George and Peppa. <laughs> right? Aren't they cute? Oh, my goodness. Give me two of them right now. What starts out as George and Peppa turns into Daisy May. <laughs> She's an apartment pig. And what starts and what still goes on as Daisy May turns into Esther, the 670 pound teacup potbelly pig. Look at her little picture in the, in the bottom corner. Would you not take her in at that size? Oh my goodness. Okay. Hopefully, I've made my point here that what you feed and what you don't feed, right. So if you've changed very little over many years, what are you feeding yourself to grow spiritually, okay? If, if you're feeding the emotional feelings of your flesh, right, you're going to look like Esther. You're going to be full of flesh, because you just keep feeding that, and it keeps growing. But uh, John chapter 14, verse 26, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus' words. Think about that. The, the, the Holy Spirit reminds us of Jesus' words. Now, if you don't mind Jesus' words in the first place, there's nothing to remind, right? You're not putting anything in there to speak out to speak to in your life, okay? And that's what I'm trying to get across is that I'm not a paradigm of amazingly perfect emotions, but what I can say is when I feel those feelings, 
that I know are negative, I can speak to them. I speak to them and try to claim emotional authority under the power of the Holy Spirit. And I proclaim the word of God, which I read. And if you read it, whether you have a good memory or not, the Holy Spirit, it says, God's word is true, amen? It says that it will remind you of the things that Jesus said. Now, emotions are from God. And we're created in his image. And Jesus demonstrated a range of emotions from joy, Hebrews 12, 2. He knew the joy that was set before him, that he even endured the cross, right? Despising his shame. From joy to anger. Jesus had a righteous anger. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, guys' hands shriveled. He was angry at their unbelief. But his emotions were under the authority of the Holy Spirit at all times. Right now, when a sinless, righteous person is righteously angered, the results are good. But human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God that God desires. James chapter one, verse 20. And James chapter four says when we're not getting our way and things aren't going the way we want them, that's when these ugly, negative, fleshly things come out. And they display themselves in whatever personality you have. And so as I close this morning, um, I'm going to have the band come up in just a minute. But I wanted to say this. When I think about emotions on, on the scale of like from fear to anger, right? From, you know, panic, anxiety, uh, that leads into depression and all of those things. And then anger from whatever range of unhealthy emotion that we have. Peace is the great equalizer to those emotions. Peace inoculates us against fear or anger or anything in between there. And Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 27, that he offers you peace, not as the world offers. So we have the ability to have peace. Jesus says it belongs to us. Galatians chapter 5, think of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are all things that need to be part of whatever personality you are, whether you're a quiet type or you're loud. Those things have to be part of your personality. And so bottom line is if you're battling emotions that are not from God, because God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but one of love and power and a sound mind. And God doesn't want us to be wrathful and angry and full of rage. So if you're battling any of those emotions this morning, we're going to ask God for help. We're not going to blame it on others. We're not going to battle it alone. But we're going to beseech and beg God who is merciful. And we're going to ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to come under over authority over our emotions and place our emotions, even our emotions, under authority. And so uh, I close with this Bible verse one last time. If you could hit it, it's the next slide there. Brian. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're going to do that this morning in just a second. In fact, the band can already uh, come to take your spot here. And I want to pray for you guys. Listen, it says, do not conform to the world. You know, for all of the emotional scars that we suffer, the world wants revenge. But the Bible says that we are to renew our minds. The world is looking for revenge for all of those scars. And we all have scars. We all have things that people have said to us, people that we loved and respected and revered and honored, and yet they still wounded us, right? So we're going to do what God's word says. 